here that uh, the banking is controlled by Jews. It, it, it's completely wrong. The Rothschilds are a major banking family. Yes, the Rothschilds are Jewish. The Rothschilds are quite complex. You have your good Rothschilds and your bad Rothschilds. Um, your bad Rothschilds tend to work with the Germans, and they are the German Rothschilds. But there are various branches of the family. Uh, don't, just because someone is a Rothschild doesn't mean to say they're necessarily a bad person. Um, uh, you have your British Rothschilds who are quite nice. You have your German Rothschilds who are not so nice. And just because somebody's Jewish doesn't mean to say, A, they're a bad person, obviously not. Uh, the Jews are the good guys. And certainly doesn't mean to say they're involved in, in, in controlling banking. The Rothschild, the German Rothschilds, the German branch of the Rothschild family has always worked very, very closely with German intelligence. Um, and, and that's a fact. And uh, there have been a, 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 a number of Jewish assets uh, that the Germans have. Uh, uh, banking is not controlled by the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, not controlled by Zionists uh, or Jews. I frankly wish they were. They'd be a lot better run. Gentlemen, the back. Well, g g ultimately, the Germans control. Uh, there's, there's significant German influence in the Bank of England and in the Federal Reserve. There always has been. And there still is. There's still, there's still are, there are still German assets inside the Bank of England. The, the Rothschilds control the banks of the world. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah uh, uh, Gentlemen, the back. Michael, um, I heard you sort of say earlier on that some of we use the Russians to kind of um, sink ships. Yes. Where we need to. Yep. Um, so it seems like the intelligence services kind of have this secret arrangement with each other that mm -hmm. they help each other out from time to time. Mm -hmm. It seems on the face of it that sometimes British, American, even German intelligence will work against its own intelligence on, on um, oh, yeah. purposes and against yeah. its own countries. So my question to you is, um, is Germany and its intelligence service really... The, the, the country itself and its own intelligence service really run by the Germans, or is it used as a front? And who really runs the, the, the bad side of the German intelligence? Yeah. Because it seems like to me it's public faces, and you can say it's the Americans, but that's run by the Russians, or it's the British, but that's run by the Germans, or it's yeah. the Germans, they run by, you know, the Australians. Uh, so it, who is really running the Germans? <laughs> well, intelli intelli intelligence... <laughs> the, the Germans run... The, the intelligence is a complex subject, but... But German intelligence is controlled from within Germany. It's not controlled by anybody else. However, however, that doesn't mean to say that, that we and the Americans and the Israelis don't occasionally get assets inside German intelligence. Obviously we do, uh, but usually it's a reversal. Reinhard Gerland, for example, was DVD, reported Admiral Canaris, and he effectively reversed his organization into the BND and then uh, had a significant influence over the CIA, but that in turn was run by German spies. Germany is an intelligence state. This is the problem. It's not really a functioning democracy. It never has been. The Germans don't do democracy. The German people may believe in democracy. The people who run Germany don't. Uh, just very quickly, coming back to the comments, just finishing off the answer on the comments. Um, the Farnborough tests were a phony. Uh, there was a key German asset uh, who had been trained at the University of Stuttgart in the Nazi period at Farnborough. The effective control, day-to-day -day control, of the Farnborough analysis of Comet Yoke Peter uh, and the test fuselage yoke uncle was done by a German asset working for the DVD. Uh, the yoke uncle fuselage did not fracture at the, uh, the point where yoke Peter is alleged to have fractured. Yoke Peter is said to have fractured at the ADF panel. The yoke uncle fuselage actually fractured at the windows. There is no evidence that down actually fractured at the windows. And we now know, because I did some of the research on this, we now know that Farnborough lied, and in their report they exaggerate, they under-exaggerated uh, by a factor of almost two-thirds the equivalent hours the test fuselage had spent in the, the water tank. The idea was, and de Havilland had invented it, de Havilland actually water-tested the comet to 100 pounds per square inch before they put the airline into service. Farnborough comes along, designs a test fuse that uh, takes over de Havilland's design of the water tank and yanks up the pressure. We now know that the guys at Farnborough were yanking the pressure up beyond 12 pounds per square inch. When the fuselage burst, it was at several pounds per square inch over the operating altitude of the comet. In other words, the test was a phony. The, the number of hours that test fuselage had to do in the test tank was something like the equivalent of 24,000. Both comets went down at around about 3,000, and that 24,000 was uh, almost certainly at an overpressure. When the fracture happened, it was an overpressure, and there is one su surviving piece of film, gloriously, one, one mistake that Jerry's made, at Farnborough, there is one piece of film which has survived, which shows the test tank being filled and actually catches in the bottom left-hand corner of the film the pressure gauge. 
and it climbed way beyond 12. So we, at, at, at times, there was only one guy at Farnborough at night in charge of this pressure tank. We don't know what pressures the plane was subject to. I think the Comet 1 fuselage is probably good for about 40,000 hours, and that was the uh, de Havilland original estimate. Now, nothing to do, nothing to do with metal fatigue. Michael, I was just working just down the road from Hatfield, building bed cars. I got to make quite a lot of the Hatfield technicians. They did their own tactics. Yep. They ran three times design pressure for three times the design hours. Yep. And it still hadn't broken. They then cranked the pressure up. This is to help the hammer rather faster. Yep. And what a bench to go by level right here is the glass fiber panel that insulated the air. Yep. And that of course was a tricky thing because it had this similar material being riveted together. Exactly. And that went to an extreme pressure. Now the other thing which I very few people mention. We have a Havilland apprentice who was there at the in our village. They did find a broken rotor in one of the jet engines uh, in one of the searches. And this is snapped. Now, the Havilland did wonder whether this known rotor could possibly have snapped through gyroscopic, far gyroscopic forces in the aircraft, in turbulence or whatever happened yeah. to it, and went this way or that way. And they ran this rotor up to 30,000 RPM, and then they tilted it violently mm -hmm. in every direction. Yep. They never managed to snap it. Correct. The, why was that rotor? Exactly. Ever? The only explanation for the rotor is the violence caused by the explosion of the IED. Uh, the, the, egg, the breakup and the crash, the losses of Yoke Peter and uh, Yoke Yoke cannot be explained by metal fatigue. Just one final point, or two final points on the comets. Uh, the wings are made of the same alloy as the fuselage at the same, from memory, for the same thickness over most of the wing. The wing would be expected to go first. In the Farnborough tests, the wing section of Yoke Uncle went first. Uh, the wings were treated as a litmus test. You would always see a failure in the wing because the wing actually took more stresses than the fuselage. Uh, there, was no, there was no fatigue in the wing. The wing to point to an end, yep. it's gone too It's gone, long. okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fascinating subject. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman um, yes. uh, shifting uh, to another subject, um, we're all very concerned about the European Union mm -hmm. and um, are being um, submerged into it. And um, also, the, uh, the, 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 our Lords of Misrule are milking uh, climate change and all that sort of thing for all their work. I recently watched a, a speech given by Lord Moncton, Moxton? Moncton? Christopher Moncton, Lundin. Christopher, nice chap, yes, Christopher. Um, and uh, he, he, he blows away the, the, uh, the, the, the um, global warming hypothesis very nicely. And uh, then right at the end, he says that the real uh, motivation behind the Copenhagen, forthcoming Copenhagen um, uh, summit is not just to get people to sign up to a climate protocol, but to get them to sign up to uh, accepting the um, imposition of one world government. Would you comment? Well, uh, there's, there's no doubt that the sort of trilats, the people who, who dream, daydream about one world government, uh, are also pushing climate change. And there's no doubt there is some of them are arguing, even Al Gore at times verges on this, uh, effectively saying that governments cannot be trusted uh, to control CO2 emissions, therefore we need supranational authority. This is all, of course, nonsense. Uh, global warming as a theory is complete rubbish. Uh, the, the carbon dioxide, human carbon dioxide emissions are about 3.3% of the total. So of, of CO2 emissions, a thirtieth, one thirtieth comes from all man-made activity. Carbon dioxide is less than a tenth of global uh, greenhouse gases. So uh, carbon dioxide is actually a minor greenhouse gas. The most important greenhouse gas is water vapor, and then you've got, I mean, it, it's, it's water vapor, water in droplet form, uh, water in gaseous form is about 90% um, uh, of, the, of the greenhouse gases. Uh, carbon dioxide is, I think, about, somewhere about 5%. So as a... As a Exactly. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, uh, the human emissions of carbon dioxide are a thirtieth. The carbon dioxide in total, including natural emissions, most of which are, are natural, uh, is responsible for about a twentieth, possibly, of, of temperature forcings. Uh, so we're talking about a thirtieth 
of a gas that may be doing no more than the 20th of the global warming. In, in other words, all human...